Pablo lo ha visto como aquí lo vemos. Hello. Okay, let me make you co-host. Can you hear me? I do hear you. Ta -da. Can you, make me... Can you hear me? I can't. Yeah. All right. Super excited. Um, I am going to... I may just make you host and jump off. And that way I don't need to end it or whatever. I can handle that. I hope. Let everybody in. In the meantime. Hey. Good evening. Good evening. Hey, Stanley. Hi. How's it going? <laughs> Excellent. I heard you were going to do some golfing with uh, Chaimar. We tried, but the um, it was too cold. They, they the course was closed because of the um, yeah conditions. Sounds like when I was playing outfield one one time and I didn't catch the ball and because the sun was in my eyes. Are you sure you just didn't want to lose golf to? Uh... No I'm kidding. <laughs> Tal, good to see you. Stephanie, welcome. Sandrine, welcome. Ah, it's good to see you guys. Welcome, welcome. All right, I am going to... Oh, hey. I'm going to formally pass the torch to Rabbi Jacobson. And duck out. All right, everybody enjoy. Thank you. All right. Hi. <laughs> good evening. I just want to make sure I don't miss anyone coming in. All right. Good evening. Good evening. All right. So good evening. Let me start here. we will today's topics. All right. We'll do a quick, quick outside and inside review of the the Talmud that we learned um, past two weeks, but before that, I just want to go, go go to some necessary information, and this is really global information of of the idea of a transaction, which happens between two people. Um, just. So um, at what and, and this is open for discussion. At what moment do you become obligated, or in the terms of our Mishnah, responsible for an object that you have bought from another, or somebody has gifted you, or somebody has rented you, or somebody lent you, or somebody gave to you to watch for them? At what moment do you think that responsibility, if anyone would like to share their thoughts, at what moment do you think that, what, what does it entail? What, what um, steps are necessary to give over that responsibility from me to another? Did, did you say if you buy something? So, uh, yeah, yeah, like even, even buying, let's, like, let's just keep it, we could keep it, with that, if I sell you something at one moment, or what steps are necessary for it to become yours? In my possession? Yeah. Con be considered yours for, for well, it, there, there's a- Well, that's, right, that's, right that's, there's that's, that's, that was my answer. In my, once it's in my possession. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> and what do you mean by that? And what, uh, what does that, uh, let's, let's talk about, let's even take an example of a home. When does the home become in your possession? Uh, the day, the moment you transfer the funds to the seller. Right. You get okay. something in exchange for Very it. Very good. <laughs> Excellent. 
so you actually, oh my God, Tal, right? So you just, uh, you, you just touched on two, according to Jewish law, two different, um, two different ways of transferring um, possessions. Interestingly, you use two, di- you t- use two words and they, they, they have different uh, ramifications. You uh-huh. use transferring the funds and exchange at once. Exactly. No, it's fascinating. Uh, I was just sharing that. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, okay. So that is in regard to buying an object. How about when, when you lent, or let's even take this example of what we're talking about. When you asked me to, uh, to watch an object for you, at one moment, am I the one that carries the responsibility of, of um, take, take what ownership? In this case, doesn't mean ownership for your profits, but when do you become responsible? And I'm gonna I'm gonna share this with a silly example, um, that I don't know why, but when I was in, in camp an overnight camp, they would constantly they would constantly put this into plays and to skits. And until today, I don't know where it fell in. Like it had nothing to. They obviously didn't have good training in screenwriting, I believe, because it was just a typical a typical scene when there was a bar involved, whether it was two, two friends going out for a drink or, um, excuse me, or a holdup or any of those type of events in a camp play or a camp um, video that they would make. They, 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 I, I, the joke came up so many times where there's two friends meeting up to, for one of them to pay back a loan. And let's just use um, A and B. A, uh, a, is, a and B meet up, they're good friends, and A needs to give back his $10,000 loan that B was so kind to lend him. And the joke, it just, and again, to me, it's, it's a little, I'm thinking about it, I, there's, some, there's some level of like, what would, it just, in my head, where during the play, that, that, you know, he comes in with that, he has the envelope of cash, and his friend asks him, do you have the cash for me? And A says, yes, I have the cash for you, but let's say Alechayim first. Thank God I was able to pay you back on time and let's celebrate for that. And while they're, while they're saying the pre-exchange Alechayim, in walks in a person and does a stick up, holds up the bar and holds up the bar and wants to uh, and ask everybody for their money. So A now takes his envelope, stuffs it in B's hand, and says, B, I paid you back. Now you deal with the stick up. Um, so for me, this is like, it's just like, I, I'm having like, like memories of sitting back in camp and I was 10 years old, 11 years old and seeing this occurrence play out in different places in camp, depending where the play was, whether it was the outdoor play or the indoor play. And, but it's a tr- when I was preparing these, co- this, these this series, I was actually thinking, that there's a very true question to that at one moment well at one moment we're not focusing on this aspect but what on what aspect but on what moment did the lender did the borrower give the money back to the lender which now he doesn't have to he doesn't doesn't owe the money anymore so although we're not dealing with that but we're dealing with the opposite at one moment did the lender give the object to the borrower then now the borrower is obligated to pay back. And, and this could be a similar situation. Somebody lent, lent somebody a car and five minutes later, he runs over, the ear is out of the tire. Or me and you had an agreement that I'm renting your car and my bad luck, I walk out and my windows, the window. becomes sort of the owner for responsibility purposes um, to become responsible for that. Any thoughts? Yeah, so um, if um, if any question, if you ask me to ask why, in the situation of a shomer, what does it entail? When do I become the actual watchman? Now I am responsible for the... 
Yeah. Anyone um anyone have any thought of when that transformation of responsibility um when the responsibility transfers from borrower to lender from renter to from the person renting it out to the renter Rabbi, i think you cut out for for a few minutes so for a little bit over there um the call the sound going in and out so maybe repeat the question about the about the car the, the scenario of agreeing to rent a car and then coming out and finding the window smashed i think uh, if you repeat the question maybe All right, give me that. Coming to rent a beautiful car from, from even you know, enterprise hertz, or or are you going a little more exotic and you want to go to one of the fancier renter places? You walk in, you rent your car, you sign your agreement, or I'm giving away some information over here, and you walk out. And let's say you, the office is in a mall, and you come out three hours later, the window smashed. You didn't touch the car yet. You didn't move the car. Um, who would be responsible for the damage that happened to the car? Or at one moment, more I'm looking for if anyone uh, has any thought. At one moment, at what moment do you think the renter will be obligated to deal with the insurance and not the company? Um... Once you is wouldn't it be when once you rent it, which means uh, yeah I think like you said you sign the agreement you're it's now even if you don't sit in the car yet to drive it it's uh, it's on you. Good, <laughs> nice. I agree. There we go. Do we have anyone that's countering that? <laughs> No? All right. So we're going to uh, quickly go through the Maimonides about these rules of transfer of ownership, just because you're, you're on the ball. So we're going to start with just Maimonides. It's from Mishnah Torah from Maimonides. Um, the, it's the section that's called, the book is called Kenyan, the book of purchasing. And we'll just, um, I, I would have, I'm just going to go through it quickly because I, it's some of it's translated, some of it's not. But here, if we start with chapter one, title of an article purchase is not acquired by verbal agreement alone. Even if witnesses have testified to this agreement, it's not enough. And here I'm just going to skip down to the bottom. And, and the end of the law is that the end of halacha one is that even if the witnesses and everyone is in agreement that we discussed a sale that is not enough. However, this is halacha two. And let me highlight that um, somewhat at least. If, um, if it is bought by one of the forms of purchases, then you don't even need any test, any witnesses and no one could back out of this contract. And in the context of we're discussing of responsibility, that would mean that at that moment you become fully responsible. The rest of chapter one discusses um, discusses the purchase of property and renting property, but um, I want to focus on what we need for our Gemara. So we're going to go. I'm going to. I am skipping forth till chapter two of the laws of purchasing halacha bays. And as you see over here, they don't have it in translated. So a behema, a animal whether a big animal or whether a small animal, meaning whether a cow, ox, or a sheep or goat, is acquired through drawing, meaning through, through you drawing it from one place to another place, you, you, you being the cause of it leaving one, one property to another property, halakhically, that will make you a owner um, <coughs> or obligated in this case of an animal. So going back to the car, um, safe to assume, right? One of the other ways is we didn't, we didn't, we, or one of the other basic ways of doing anything is with a contract. So the second, as I think 
we had we had uh, all the opinions agreed that once the contract is signed, you would become obligated even if you didn't use it yet. Besides, obviously, if you put that in the contract, but a signing of a contract has a transfer of ownership. But over here we have an halacha, the second chapter halacha, the fifth halacha, where he says an animal, one of the ways of being, I'm going to use the 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 the, the, the term used in yeshiva is a kinyan, a purchase, or to be kona something, to be a person that acquires something, you could do it by simply drawing the animal and um, the Rambam goes on, Maimonides goes on to explain that it doesn't mean actually pulling it. It means even if you used your voice to get it to transfer, um, <coughs> to get it to go from your property to my property. Um, I'm just going to also point out that obviously it's necessary that both people are in agreement. If both people aren't in agreement, then there's nothing to talk about, right? Um, so, and then I just want to point out, and I, okay, I'm just going to point out that in a few halachas later, a few laws later, Maimonides discusses the laws about buying something now for the future, which is, um, again, a full discussion. Um, and Maimonides, at least, again, Maimonides is already giving us the end, the end decision without going through the whole process. But Maimonides accepts, and it, so it is, that you could buy something on condition, which means I could tell you we're doing the transaction today, but it only, it only will take effect if this happens over the next amount of time. But at the moment, there has to be the transaction for that to happen. So, for example, um, going to the even to the modern day example, the car is yours. Here, we, we're signing the contract today, but the car only becomes yours in 30 days. So then the car becomes yours in 30 days. However, you still must have a Kenyan, you still must have a action that transfers the power. I'm um, going back to what I believe Tal said earlier, right, about the transfer, whether using, giving money or giving, changing. Again, we're not gonna focus on that for our class because it is a full on, it's, it's a full discussion later on, but that just just to put it out there for information purposes, that one of the, the, the basic ways of being Kona something about buying something is obviously contract, obviously paying the value for it, like saying giving the funds, but then there's something else called the Kenyan Khalifin, a purchase of ex through exchange, which then you are exchanging products, not exchanging the value. So even if you were to give somebody a thousand dollar diamond for a ten thousand dollar watch, as long as they're in agreement with it and they take the thousand dollar diamond, that itself will also be enough for a transfer of power of ownership. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of discussion about what that entails, what would be included, and whatnot. Okay, so that is just something necessary. And again, the words here are Kenyan purchasing and the people involved are the Kona, the buyer and the Makna, the seller. Um, <clears throat> in our case, we have the Kenyan, the purchase. We have over here and in our, in our, in our Gemara, purchase doesn't mean the purchase of ownership. It means a purchase of, of, of responsibility. And in our, in our the specific case, we're also talking about the, pur the purchase of financial benefits that may come from it as we were about to mention. So that is that is something important to know for for Talmud study, especially for this uh, for this upcoming few lines of Talmud. Together with that, um, well, together with that, there is another discussion regarding buying an object is could you buy an object that does not exist in the world yet? Any thoughts on that? Could you buy something that doesn't exist? Um, could you buy something that doesn't exist based on the promise that it will later? Yes. Yeah. Well, 
I, I was leaving it loose, but yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 I'm happy. Um, so very good. This is again, we're not we're not diving fully into this topic, but um, are you you're saying yes that you could? That's what I said. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. I don't know. Else. No, you 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 use very careful words. You said if on the promise that it will exist. Yes. Very well. Okay. Very, you'll see that that was very uh that was very cleverly said <laughs> okay thank you <laughs> <laughs> you'll see that, that 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 fits very well with the, what the talmud's about to say and again that's just something to think about and that's something that our talmud is going to be discussing and the reason for that is is because let's get to our review and then we'll see that our mishnah is really talking about something that's not in existence yet um and then we're going to go back to the to, to your wording of uh, to sorry that was if you don't mind give me your name um, about on the promise that it will exist and we'll see when Torah accepts well at least we'll we'll, we'll uh, start the conversation of when Torah accepts that to be a proper sale. All right, so let's just with those two introductions about the idea of being kona something of buying something and buying something that doesn't exist in the world yet. Just put, have those two ideas in your head because that's what we will be dealing with today. Let's just quickly go through. We're gonna, I'm going to do a quick read and a quick just break down the Gemara. Um, I believe Rabbi Solish sent out a few questions today um, as a quick review, and we'll go through those questions as we go along. If anybody would like to answer, please do. And um, then we will move on to the next piece. So we'll just go back. Here where you where you have highlighted, we're gonna do a quick Hazara. Um one who deposits it by his friend, Behema Okalim, a animal or a vessel, Venignevu Osha Avdu. It was lost, it was stolen, or it was lost. Now, Shilem Veloy Ratza Li Shava. The watchman decided he will pay for the object because he did not want to swear. Side well, important but side note, Shahare Amru, because they said, Shomer Hina, my unpaid watchman, Nishba Biyotza, he swears and he goes out, meaning he leaves this, he leaves this responsibility, he leaves the ownership, uh, 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 leaves this watchman and leaves this relationship, and now he's not obligated in anything. So the case of the Reisha. The case of the, of the beginning of our Mishnah is that you ask me to watch something for you. I watch it for you. It gets stolen or lost. And instead of swearing, I decide I will pay you. What will be the rule? Well, not yet. Nimza Ganev, the one who stole it was found. Mishalim Tashlume Kefal, he pays the payment of double. Tabachu Machar, if it was stolen, cooked or stolen, Mishalim Tashlume Arba Vechamisha. The one who stole it pays the payment of four or five. So that's all part of the case. What would be the rule? Lemi mishalem, to who does he pay? Lemi shapikadonets lo, to whom the deposit is by. So the ratio of the Mishnah um, is where I ask you to watch something for me. You ask me to watch something for me, for you. I agree. It was stolen or lost. I pay you money instead of swearing, and now any financial rights, benefits that might come from that are mine. Nishba Belorotz Shalim. This is the safe of the Mishnah, the end of the Mishnah. Um, and again, that's usually most, most Mishnot, I shouldn't say most, many, because um, they never counted, but many, many Mishnot have a Risha and a safe in the beginning and the end. I did point out in the first class that some also have a mitsuyusa, a middle one. But Nishba Balaratzali Shalim, the safe of the Mishnah is the end of the Mishnah is if the person, the watchman, again, the case is the same case. I somebody gave somebody something to deposit. However, instead of paying, he swore and he did not want to pay. Nimsa Ganev, the person who stole it was found. Misham the one who the, the, uh, he, the, the, he needs to pay a payment of double. Tabach Machar, if he cooked it or he stole it, or he if he cooked it or he sold it, Misham Tashlumi Abu Bhamisha needs to pay the payment of four or five. Nami Mishalim. 
to whom does he pay? The Baal Hapikadon to the owner of the thing that was deposited. So that's the ratio of the Mishnah. That's the safe of the Mishnah. And we have two cases and two rules. Um, Frakti Gemara, which is ask the Gemara. Why do we have to teach Behema? Why does the author of the Mishnah need to teach us animal? And why does the author of the Mishnah need to teach vessels? Answers the Gemara, Srichi, I need both. And just a quick, yes, last week we pointed out that, that every time we have Srichi, that means we pointed out that both are needed for a halachic for a halachic purposes. And um, I believe um, Stanley last week uh, summarized this, this, this piece of Gemara perfectly, but let's go through that quickly, right? Um, so Stanley, you want to share with us again, what, what, would, what would we think if, um, if the Tana would, if the author of the Mishnah would only say vest animal? Anyone? Right. The Itana Behema, if the author of the Mishnah would only teach an animal, Hava Amina, I would have said, Behema, by an animal who the Makni Lake Fela is when he sells him the double. We show him the Nafish Tircha because there's a lot of burden. To take the animal in and to take the animal out. Aval Kalim. However, when it comes to vessels, the Lai Nafish Tirichayu, where there isn't a lot of burden. Perhaps you would say that the depositor, the one who deposited, is not ready to sell off the rights, the financial rights of the double. Uh, um, Rabbi Jacobson, a, a question here yes. it seems to differentiate between bur something that has a burden and a non-burden. Is is the is there a difference at all between animate or inanimate, or you know, live or not alive, or is that just implied? If it's live, there's a burden. If it's not a lot, yeah. you don't have the burden. Good question. Good question. Um, I think in this case, at least for for our page, meaning at least for the way our what to the extent that our page of Talmud is dealing with it, it's going to the extent of live or not live. Um, I think it's just being very inclusive in behema, including all forms of animal, any any living thing that has that's a lot of burden. Make sense? Make, makes sense. Uh, yeah. since, since, we're um, pausing, since we're pausing for a second, th this might be kind of, like, I'm trying to figure out what really is the translation of Lamed yud Hey because it seems to, like I'm trying to follow along and like it, it seems perfect. to be a few things. So Lamed yud Hey is Makne Lay to him. Got it? Was that? It's, yeah. Well, so is every, so any anywhere it's lamed yud hey, it's it's so it's to him. Yeah, like so. Now sometimes you're not going to translate it literally. So like lama lay lemisne, why to him does the tana need to teach? But the literal translation of lay is to him. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking. So that is, if we would have animal, we wouldn't be able to include, we would think, now going back to what was mentioned earlier, that obviously a business transaction needs to be something that's agreed on by the buyer and the seller, perhaps only when the buyer is in a good mood and, and feeling satisfied with uh, what he got out of the seller, out of the, sorry, only when the seller is feeling good that he got something out of the seller, out of the buyer, will it be willing to sell him the double? Right? Only in a case of an animal where the animal said, in a case of an animal where the buyer, where the watchman had to do so much work, so much work for the person that he was watching it for, is the, is the seller ready to say, you know what? Yankel or Adam or Jerry, take the financial benefits that might come later. If the author of the Mishnah taught vessels, I would have thought, 
who de kamakni lekvela. By vessels, he sells in the double. Mishum de lo nafish kvilayu, since they are not more than double. Vessels, the financial benefits of vessels never e ends up more than double. Avo behema, however, by an animal. De chitavach umachar, for if he cooked it or he sold it, Mishalim tashlume dalid behe. The person who stole it will be obligated to pay four or five times. So the financial benefits there are huge. Perhaps I would say that he doesn't sell to him the double, the financial rights to more. And therefore, tzricha, therefore I must have both. I must have. The Mishnah must say cow, and he also must say vessels, because each one includes another includes another another angle so that is what we we studied last week and two weeks ago now we're ready for the new piece of the gemara and what we're going to be dealing with today yes would it be correct to say that this discussion in the gemara so far as to who the gets the benefit uh, I'm sorry, as to why we're dealing with both the animal and the vessels is only going to the ratio of the Gomorrah, of the, of the Mishnah, because that's the only time that there's, that we're not even talking about the Seifa yet. We do not, yes, very, it, very good. Because yeah. it's clear that there's no, they're not, it, it's the owner yes. of the property in the, in the Seifa, but there's a question in the ratio only. Right. Okay, just wanted to be sure. Yeah. Very good. Thank you for bringing that up. And also, while you're at it, thank you for, for, um, for, for giving me the leeway there. Is in general that would be the, the the regular way of the Gemara is in almost every case to start um, breaking down the ratio. And um, usually, before to start discussing the Seifa, he would bring in a two. A few words with it, with like two dots before and two word dots after, and that will hint to you to go back to the Mishnah and see where in the Mishnah that is. Thank you for yes. I see. Thank you for bringing Thank that you. up. All right. So maskivla rami barchama. Maskivla is a challenge that rami barchama had, um, and I'm just going to I'm going to give a general rule over here. When it comes to Gemara, and really, I mean, the same thing is in life, um, there's some questions that are challenging what we think or what we're saying, and some questions is a wonder. Um, and and the, the example, just the most basic example, is if I ask you if it's raining outside or not raining outside, does that change anything? <laughs> it doesn't. I'm wondering. Um, if I ask you, why is the sun out when the sun is out? The sun is out. You could wonder from today to tomorrow. You could question it from today to tomorrow, but that's what it is. So if you come into the room, into, into office, and you say, guys, it's pouring outside, and everybody says, well, no, it's not, because if it's pouring, why are you not soaked? Okay, you could question what I said. Um, a challenge would be where no, Rabbi Jacobson, we are challenging you because I walked in the same time as you and it's not raining, right? Um, <coughs> so in Talmud, when you see the words maskifla, means we are be, we're about to challenge a, a, a thought or a rule to the extent that if you can't answer it, the law, it's going to be such a strong question that the law or your, or your understanding will become, will, we be, will, be, be, will become void. We will become invalid because we are challenging you with such a strong thing. We're not just asking why is it like that, we are challenging you with a piece of information which makes your previous statement, your previous understanding invalid. 
So, Rami Bar Chama has a challenge to the idea that our, the way we understand our Mishnah. We understand that our Mishnah is talking about the, the depositor the selling the rights, the financial rights to the watchman. Right? That's, how, that's what our Mishnah is dealing with. Mm -hmm. Says the Talmud, says Rami Bar Chama, I am going to challenge that premise, that, that idea that you have. Based on what? Veha. Behold. Um, I'm in a, one of my students once put it, I am shocked that you could even think such a thing. Veha. Mm -hmm. Behold. Ain adamakna tavar shalabala olam. A person does not sell off something that did not come to the world yet. So here, again, this is not the place of the discussion, but just to put it out there, there is a discussion throughout a couple of topics in Talmud. Could I sell something that does not exist in the world yet? And we, ex the Talmud, or at least, at least for the purposes over here, where we're not having the discussion, the accepted approach is that we do not allow a sale of something that does not exist in the world yet. Is, is what is what isn't that what selling a patent is? You thought of something. Very good. Very very good. So we're we're gonna get that in the next few lines, but very good. Let let, let me let me touch on that in a moment. Fantastic question. Um, I, and I, I also, I had the same question regarding stocks in a certain way. Um, the, the, right. So let, let me just put it into context of this mission now before we go to the question on a patent. Um, if <coughs> our mission is dealing with what? Is, is the depositor, what is the watchman buying? He's buying the, the rights to get the double, to get the four, to get the five times. He's not buying the actual cow. The cow is stolen. The cow is by, is in now in, um, or the vessel, the vessel is gone. What is, what is he selling him? He's selling him the financial rights, the financial benefits that might occur at a later point. So says the Talmud, but says, so Rami Bar Chama challenges and says, oh, sorry, Rami Bar, I should have said that. His last, his last name isn't Bar Chama. Rami is a name. Bar means the child of Chama. So, like, um, and it, 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 it's it's throughout throughout the Talmud that you see that you see that um, that um, that reference. Rami Bar, or the word Bar means son. So over here, this word means Bar means son. Should have said it earlier. Um, now. He comes and he says, you're telling me that our Mishnah, that the watchman could get the double, could get the four or five times because he paid. Okay, I get he paid it. I understand that he paid, which, he, which means that he did do the proper transaction to buy something, but what did he buy? So let, let's just break it down to days. Um, September 1st, you give me, somebody gives me a cow to watch. On September 10th, the cow gets stolen. On September 15th, I'm supposed to return the cow. I come to the owner of the cow and I say, listen, sir, I would love to give you back your cow, but your cow is missing. It was stolen from me. I went out to the supermarket. I went out to a football game, those good old days. And I came back. My house was broken into, my farm was broken into, your cow is gone. Again, this is September 15th. September 15th, and I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm happy, my team won. Take the money, I'm not interested in going to court with you. I'm about to head out on a vacation. You can, I, <laughs> I, I'm, I have a few business deals that I need to deal with. If I'm gonna have to go to court with you, it's gonna be bad for me, it's gonna be bad for my reputation. Just take the money for your cow. This all happens on September 15th. What am I buying on September 15th? What is there? What is there? We did a business transaction on September 15th on what? 
Is there anything that we're just, that we that we have on hand to deal with? R rights to the recovery. Rights to the recovery. Very good. But the, is is the recovery there? Potential is there. Potential is there, right? So this goes back, and that's exactly what Rami, the cha the son of Chama's question is: We can't, you can't sell potential, right? Ain't other makna. A person cannot purchase something that doesn't exist in the world yet. It it exists. And I'm just going to jump ahead. Not for that. It it it's a realistic. It, it is a reality that exists. It's not like it's a flying car that doesn't exist. So I, I great, you're, you're, you're walking, no, it's, it's beautiful. You're walking straight into the next, to the, the Gemara continues that conversation and basically points out, you're right, that if it would be something that potentially exists but's close by, that would be okay. But the Gemara is going to give us it's like a four or five step pro. It's going to take you four or five steps for you to get back that double. So the Gemara says with the double, it's not just potential. It's like hypothetical. But very good. Very good. That's where the Gemara is going to go with that. Um, but let, let's go back to your question about, yeah. So the question is clear. The question is, how is it possible to buy that potential rights of, now I'm just going to point out, that I, and I actually asked this to a rabbi um, this, this Shabbos regarding stocks. We, the first class we mentioned that this really touches on the idea of stocks and investments. But if you think about it, by stocks and investments, at the moment that I bought something, I actually bought a title or I bought percentage in the company or I bought however it works. I did get a certificate that I was buying and that is going to be growing. Over here, on the other hand, what is the watchman buying? Nothing. Right? So, uh, and this might go back to the idea of a patent also. Right? Um, at the moment, I am buying a patent. I'm, I'm buying, if I make a patent and I buy it off you, I bought the idea. And there's, there's obviously papers involved, which means there's a contract involved. So now I, there, there, is, there is something for this business deal to rely on. Like the business deal sort of falls onto that paper, falls onto that patent. But on the other end, if you sell me an idea that that's not measurable, that that might not work. Right? Does that at least give us a, a, a little? Little salt to a little, a little taste to an answer to the question about a patent. Yeah. Can a distinction be drawn between the cow and the penalty? Whereas the cow does exist. It may not be here now, but it's somewhere. The penalty only comes into play if there's a thief found and he ends up having to pay this penalty that doesn't, that may never happen. But the cow is an existing thing. Amazing. Yes, penalty. yes, we're gonna, that's ultimately, you're jumping to the answer, the answer will be that. Okay. The answer will be that, that you're right. If the only thing he was selling was the penalty, that would be a problem. So therefore, the Gemara is gonna, the Gemara is gonna, the Gemara is gonna rely on the logic that you're using to answer this question. Okay. Excellent. So right? because there's a cow, we don't cross the line of a non-existent object being yes. sold. Okay. But that means that the cow needs to be part of the discussion also, which goes back to the point that was brought up in the previous class about the babies involved. Because they're not just selling the rights. Yeah. Very good. This is fantastic. Right? Now let, let's just break down this. Yeah. So that's the question. The question is how seemingly could you buy the rights? Now, even according to Rav Meir, which he did say. So Rav Meir has an opposing view that what? That that a person could purchase something that doesn't exist in the world yet. A patent would be included in this. 
um, and many other things. Um, and this, we're going to give it a, a, a clear, right? So we do have an opinion that does say you could buy things that don't exist. Again, the general, the Talmudic terminology is Adam ma, um, <coughs> ain't Adam makna davashalobala olam. A person can't buy something that doesn't exist, or Adam makna davashalobala olam. A person could buy something that does not exist. So, Hani Mili, these words, when does Ram, even the opinion that says, according to the opinion that says you could buy something that doesn't exist, is Kigon Paris Dekel. Are, for instance, in the situation of me buying fruits of a palm tree. So, meaning to say, you come to me and you offer me a, uh, and the, think, a, <coughs> you come to me and you offer me an investment in your, you, not investment. I come to you and I say, hey, I want to start growing wine. Could I buy one acre of your, of your, um, could I buy one acre of trees from, from, from your vineyard? It's my first year. I want to go in slowly. I want to buy one acre. And it seems like back in the olden days, that was a very normal way of doing things. It was a very common thing that you were, you were buying off land areas of tree for trees for a certain amount of years. Um, so the Gemara says, the Talmud tells us, that Rameyer does allow the purchase of things that don't exist in the world yet. However, that is when there's a very clear definition and a very clear probability of it happen, happening. And that would, that would be going back to, um, if, you, if you're, please remind me who said the, these words, if you promise it will come. So the Talmud tells us in a situation where you could promise that it will come, or that's very likely that it will come. So then we allow a purchase to go through even though that thing doesn't exist yet. So the Talmud also discusses this in context of somebody having a, bit, a child, a pregnant woman, um, a tree that has been giving off fruits for years, or a field that, a field that has been known for growing, for growing wheat in it. Um, all these type of things we could assume that they will come to be, right? And again, I think this would be going back to, um, going back to, um, <coughs> to going back, I tell this, was that you that asked about the patent? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so th this would be going back where it's a, it's a very, you're not selling a hypothetical idea. You're selling something very measurable. Um, you're selling something that is that could be done, um, that has that has documents involved to it. It's more like the fruits of a fruits of a of a um, of a palm tree that we will, we assume could come into fr in, into fruitation could come out into reality. Okay. Now, what's unique about the fruits of a tree, Davidi the Asu, which tend to come, which will eventually come, right? So here we have, um, going back, so I could sell you something that doesn't exist if it's most likely going to come in existence. But now the Gemara is about to point out that this financial benefit of finding, of getting the double is very unlikely. And let's, let's take this journey. Aval hacha. However, over here, when it comes to the case of getting the double, and now we turn the page to, right? We're still Parakamafkid. We're on Lama Dalit Amr Aleph, 34. <coughs> hey, number one, Miyamar Demiganva, whoever says that this object will be stolen. So now, before we go to this question, according to Torah, and we brought the Maimonides for this, are words enough to sell you a product? Right? Maimonides, let's just quickly look back at the Maimonides. 
he starts off the book of purchasing with these words. First four words of the book of purchasing in Maimonides. Hamikach eno nikna bedvarim. Title to an article, ownership of an article, purchased is not acquired by, ver by verbal agreement alone. Right? So we know that a court, right? They can't, the words, words itself isn't enough to, to sell it to, to, to sell it to you. So this transaction of me buying the financial rights from you must go back to the moment that you gave me the cow. Meaning when you gave me the cow to watch for you, you also together with that moment, you also told me, told me, or, or we assume you accept the fact that if it gets stolen and I pay you, instead of, in, in, if I pay you, I get the financial rights. Okay. So number one, if that's the situation, Miyamar Demiganva. Whoever says that this cow is going to be stolen. So that's already one step away. And if you would like to say that it will be stolen, whoever says, you will find the person who stole it. And even if you found a person that stole it, ready for this? Miyomer Demishalim. Who even says he will need a? <coughs> who says he will need to pay the double? And give me a moment, Dilma Modi Miftar. Perhaps he will admit, and he will be exempt from paying the double. So let me give you another rule over here, which I sort of, not me, the Gemara kept in, kept us in 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 hiding. Over here, and if you look, you have it. One of the beauty, th beautiful things I look at, like about the the website, the Merkava, is <coughs> there's a rule in the Torah, which is well, there's two forms of payment in Torah. There's pay payment for the damage you did, and there's payment for the damage you did, and then there's something called a knas which is a penalty. Now, damage is a very simple thing. I borrowed your thing. I broke it. I need to pay you for it. So I'm paying you back your money. If I stole an object, not me, heaven forbid, shouldn't use that example. If somebody use, steals something from another person, you need to give them back what you stole. There's nothing that you could do to get away from that financial loss that you caused, not you, that somebody caused. However, when it comes to the penalty of paying double, if I run to court because I feel that the authorities are closing in on me and I right away send a message to the judge, I don't know if this would work in, uh, I don't know if this would work in 2020, but hypothetically, I send out a tweet and I say, guys, I'm about to get caught. I, uh, I admit my crime of stealing the cow. And I owe Jack a $10,000 cow. I will not be obligated to pay the double because it became based on my own admission. So you only pay the double in a scenario where you, where you were able, where the person that you stole from is able to bring you, needs to bring you to court and go through that pain of getting you to admit in court. But if I go to court, because I even if I feel that the authorities are closing in on me and I jump out of my back window and I run to court and court says, hey, aren't you the guy we're looking for? And you go, yes, 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 I, I'm giving back the cow right now. I don't have to pay double. So what the Talmud just did was made it such a, made it a very, made the, 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 made the possibility of getting the double 
the penalty of knas, the, the, the penalty of koiful, of double, into a very hypothetical possibility. Number one, is it going to get stolen? If it gets stolen, are you ever going to find a guy? And even if you're going to find a guy, maybe the guy is going to admit before he needs to pay the double. So if so, Rami Bar is asking, what are you buying? What are you buying? You're buying a hypothetical possibility of what? There's no documents involved. There's no living cow involved. There's no cow at all involved. Not yet. Um, Stanley will get there. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get to the actual cow involved, right? If all I sold you is the possibility of a profit, it's a hypothetical, it's a hypothetical sale. The problem with that is just to give you a little, a little insight into that Talmudic discussion is when I'm selling you a hypothetical thing, there's two problems. Problem number one is that I'm not really selling you anything, right? Because it's hypothetical. I'm selling you like this distant possibility. I'm selling you, <coughs> I'm selling you something that's very unlikely. And also number two, what am I buying? Meaning there doesn't seem to be a proper trans transfer of ownership of anything because it's so hypothetical. So if it's so distant from reality, if it's so far from actually happening, says the Talmud, how could you understand that that's what our Mishnah is talking about? Why we don't do that? In Jewish law, we, in Jewish law, we don't accept that you could buy something that doesn't exist in a scenario that is so hypothetical, that it's so distant from reality. If, you know what, if we're talking about trees, no problem. That could work. But we're not talking, we're not talking about trees. We are talking about, we are talking about a hypothetical possibility of getting paid double. Right? So uh, that is our, so we're, we're at a point where what is, how could the watchman end up getting the payments of two, two times or four or five times, right? So although we're, we're hitting on the 857, but I would like to at least start the conversation of the answer. And this is, and again, Stanley, or um, please, if, if is, is where you touched on this. Amar Rava, Rava says, and he answers as follows. Naseka Omerlo. It's as if he tells him. It's as if the person that deposited tells the person that's watching it, if it is stolen, and you would like to pay me, that my cow is given to you starting from right now. Meaning to say, the way we understood the Mishnah before is we were talking about only financial rights. Rava, let's, let me just do this one more time. Amar Rava, Rava says, Nase ka it's like the owner said to the watcher, if it is stolen, and you would like to pay me, behold, my cow is sold to you from today. Not the financial rights, my cow. And therefore what? Let's go through those days again. September 1st, you come to me and could you watch my cow for me? I said, Mark, 100%, I'll watch your cow for you. On that day, the rabbis accept that Mark tells me, Mendel, listen up. If, I, if it happens one day that my cow is stolen and you decide to pay me for it, which is a hypothetical possibility, right? It's if that happens, but I am selling you my cow from today. So September 1st, I, you gave me your cow to watch. September 10th, it was stolen. September, 
September 15th, when I paid for the cow, from what day on the calendar is the cow mine? From September 1st. And because the cow was mine from September 1st, whose cow was stolen on September 10th? My cow. Watch her. So why is the person that stole it paying the double? He's paying me the double, not because I bought the financial rights, but because I bought the actual cow. And because I bought the actual cow, he stole my cow. And if he stole my cow, he's got to pay me, got to pay me the double. So Stanley, this was going back. You, you were suggesting this in other words. Right, you were saying that once the, once we could involve the actual living cow, now we're not now as the watchman. I didn't just purchase the benefits; I also bought the cow. And because the benefits come together with the cow, now it's not just hypothetical. Now it's a reality that has the potential of becoming worth much more if certain details play out. Yes. So that's, that's our journey for today. Our journey for today is where we suggested how in the world could you buy the financial rights to the cow if it's, if it's a hypothetical possibility. And the Talmud winds up with saying, you're... <coughs> all right, see you guys next week. Um, yeah, um, no problem. So, and that, so that's where we finish off today's Talmud is that not only are you buying the financial rights, you're also buying the actual cow. So that's the, the we're, we're finished. We'll finish with that. I'll be around for another few minutes. If anyone has any questions, they want some clarity um, for whoever wants to, uh, whoever needs to go. Again, this is just for questions. We won't be doing any further studying. So all those that are going or have a wonderful vacation, a wonderful trips. Thank um, you. Thank you. Enjoy your time. Thank and, you. Uh, looking forward to, again, next class is in two weeks. Oh. I guess I think the third. Okay. I believe the third, right? Um, so next week, probably, let me, I'm just checking which date it is. Yeah. So till see you guys in two Tuesdays. Uh, and again, whoever, oh no, it's not. It's the fifth. It's the fifth. Right. If anyone has any questions, I'm here for the next few minutes. And um, thank you, Rabbi Ashkoach. All right. All the best. All right, have a wonderful night. Anyone? Okay. Anyone? Anyone? All right. Have a wonderful night. Stop sharing.